Nepali, could you help with that, please? Good evening, everyone. Welcome to I Focus Online Lecture 257. And this is the Ophthalmic Trauma Special Series, and this is the second session. And today we have with us Dr. Shreya Shah Ma'am from Dushti Netrale, and she'll be talking on trauma of the eyelid, adnexa, and extraocular muscles. I uh, request Dr. Ashok Grover, sir, to please introduce Shreya Ma'am. Over to you, sir. Good evening, everyone. Lovely to be a part of iFocus Online. Thanks to Santosh iFocus team for this opportunity and for having taken up ocular trauma as the theme for these four lectures. It is a pleasure and honor to introduce Dr. Shreya Shah. She has been a pioneer in a big way in having been the co-founder of a rural eye care center, which has been unparalleled in its amount of work that it has carried out and in the amount of research in rural-based themes and trauma-based themes that she and Dr. Mehul have carried out from that center, developing it into one of the most prestigious centers with a very high volume of work catering to the sections of the society who were otherwise deprived of the quality services that they deserve. She has a number of uh, achievements to her credit, including over 100 publications, nearly a thousand national presentations, 117 national presentations, authored book and chapters, and most importantly, as a wonderful teacher and as a great human being, who's uh, affectionate to everyone and very caring to her patients. Joy to have her speak on this subject. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Honavar, sir, for allowing me to be here. It's a great series of I Focus, and I'm grateful to my, my inspiration also, Dr. Grover, sir, who introduced me in such a nice way. Uh, should I start my slides, sir? Should I share my screen? Yes. So as the topic is Mom, quite deep, yeah. The, the slideshow is not started now. Could you? It's not started now? No, ma'am. Ma'am, I request you to close the slideshow once again and then share the screen. Okay. It's okay, a possibility. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. I do that again. Yes, ma'am. Now it is seen. Is it seen now? No, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, uh, it will be great if you can just uh, close all the uh, slots once, and when you I are close everything. Okay, ma'am. Ma so, ma you, like, you need to come I... to the come back to the Zoom window. There is a green button on the bottom, six o'clock. Share screen. I've done yes, that. Yes, ma'am. And the pop-up yeah. will come. Just click the share button again, the blue button. Perfect, ma'am. Uh, now you can open the okay, presentation. That? Yeah, yeah, just open the presentation now. Yeah. Are you able to see now? Uh, no, ma'am. Just a sec, ma'am. Just a sec.
uh, Rish and uh, now start the, this, you can do the screen share again, ma'am, after opening the presentation. Okay. After opening the presentation, right? Yes, ma'am. You uh, can start the slide share in your system like you did the, when we uh, checked it and then automatically share the, yeah. It's open now. Now you can go down and click on the share screen, ma'am. Now, is it not seen now? Uh, no. Everything is stopped. Everything is stopped now. Presentation can tell. I hear you. I Share Did you share? Yeah. It worked fine, ma'am, that time. What is happening? I don't know. Screen share video. Yeah. Can you see? See. This is okay. This is share screen. But you have to. I do. Thank you. Now? Yeah. Now? Yes. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. The so, topic is uh, quite big. Can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you so much. The topic is quite big. So we'll just look in, into its three part. So first we'll start with as such when the, whenever there is trauma, we'll start with uh, uh, orbit and muscular part and then we'll go to lead and lacrimal. So this is the uh, orbital trauma trauma i'll in i've already included everything in uh, uh, muscle trauma and orbital trauma so how the muscle injury happens it can be damage to supranuclear structures oculomotor nuclei of nerve extraocular muscle com or combination of any so if you look at uh, how the trauma occurs it is uh, it can be a strabismus and trauma. It can be immediate strabismus or it can present as a late. If it is immediate, it can be direct trauma to the muscle, uh, muscle rupture, muscle tear or flap tear. It can be simple pressure effect on muscle because of orbital edema. It can be a neurological or sometimes it's an indirect effect like head injury, concussion, contusion. If strabismus presents late, it can you have to find out both the place. The cause can be at local level or at distant level. So if it is at local level, simple deprivational or mechanical injuries or distant level, CCF, hematoma or head injury. So we'll look into detail of it. What can happen to muscle when it is uh, when there is trauma? So the first thing, muscle can be contused. Muscle can be contused. It's not moving. Mm, no, ma'am. No. Is it a video, ma'am? No, it's not with video. Just click on the screen, ma'am. I think then it will move. I stop share and restart. No, no ma'am. This is uh, just go forward in the slides, ma'am. Uh, it's not moving both. Uh, Ma'am, click on the uh, screen uh, and then start. Mm. Okay. Now, can you see? Yeah, ma'am, we can see. Yeah. So, first thing with muscle can happen is muscle can be contused. It can be partially lacerated. It can be completely lacerated. Or muscle can be pulled into two. Or it can be a snap. We can call it as a snapped muscle or pulled into two. There can be a traumatic disinsertion of muscle. Muscle can be lost when there is trauma. 
uh, and it can be incarcerated or entrapped. So patient who usually suffer blunt trauma to the globe or particular peri periocular area, especially directly on the globe or on the cheek, usually risk for developing orbital floor fracture. Why this? Because if you look at the thing, the intra infra orbital canal is only 0.23 millimeter. Otherwise, medial uh, orbital floor is posterior medial orbital floor is 0.37 millimeter and lateral portion uh, is 1.25 millimeter. So this portion is prone to damage more. So if you look at general pathology, there can be two theories to for the blow out fracture in orbit. One is hydraulic theory. So when there is a blunt trauma, uh, it just increases the intraorbital pressure and it can result into a trauma. Or sometimes second theory is buckling theory. theory. So blunt trauma to the face as a punch on the cheek transmits the pressure as a wave. So with this wave, it opens up and it increases the pressure and then a blood fracture happens. Uh, so whenever muscle carceration is there, whenever there is blood fracture, it could be pure blood fracture or impure blood fracture. When there is pure, usually orbital rim is intact. Impure orbital rim is not intact. Etiology can be usually in the ball or sports injury, but usually here will be road traffic accidents. Floor, usually uh, blood fracture can be type 1, type 2, type 3, we'll see all, or Y-type blowout fractures. So this is type 1 fracture with the elevation defect. It is called type 1 antral fracture. When there is type 2 antral fracture, there will be a depression defect, which will not be able to depress the eye. And when there is both the defect up and down, patient is not able to move, it is called type 3 antral fracture. So, but sometimes the child comes with total white eye, just giving history of trauma. But if you look here, it is light in ophthalmos and patient looks up and you are able to see there is elevation defect. So this is a white eye blowout fracture, wave fracture, which needs immediate urgent repair. Medial wall of the uh, orbit usually it's a second common thing because usually it is associated with, associated with orbital floor. And medial wall again has a two type, type one limitation of abduction and type two limitation of adduction due to just mechanical restriction, medial ductus flap tear or MR palsy. So you have to look for uh, medial ductus entrapment whenever you see there is a um, horizontal defect. Roof fracture is very, very uh, uncommon, but with road traffic accident, it can happen. So you need to have all the CT scans yeah. available with lateral wall broad fracture is also very, very less common, but it can happen and it can incarcerate the lateral ductus muscle. What is the eighth thing that can happen to muscle is flap tear. We'll see in detail of it. The ninth thing can happen to muscle is slipped muscle in its sheet. How to diagnose? Proper history taking, gross examination, including edema, hemorrhage, injury mark, method of injury, object of injury, associated other damage to the structures. And you need to check the best corrected uh, visual acuity, facial asymmetry, paraesthesia, anesthesia of infraorbital supply, motility disorders, diplopia charting, hair screening, just to show the restriction of field field of vision to check the binocular vision, diplopia charting, you need to measure whether there is exophthalmus or inophthalmus, intraocular pressure, specific, specifically gaze, specific intraocular pressure rise can happen in way by fracture. Pupil you need to examine and visual field. Along with that, we have to support with radiological investigations like ultrasonography, CT, mainly coronal, MRI with fat suppression, dynamic MRI is the best thing we can detect the orbital injury or incarceration of the muscle is there on it. As I said, there are two uh, different uh, things like whenever there is a uh, children, the muscle incarceration happens and it traps, the. it's like trap door, it traps it back. So there will not, there may not be herniation, but there will be incarceration. 
and in adults usually there will be a herniation of tissue in the maxillary antrum this is simple mri of muscle hematoma you can see the muscle is hematoma uh, test here a uh, clinical diagnosis also you have to do with ocular motility testing force reduction test and force generation test ocular motility test has to be done in all the uh, things with cover uh, and cover and cover and cover test saccadic velocities everything force reduction test has to be performed in everybody where whether is it where whenever is it is possible sometime force generation test also can be uh, done with q tip which is very difficult but it can be done in this patient if you look at the force generation test uh, when the patient when we are holding the eye on adduction and asking the patient to move uh, the eye laterally you can see the resident is also holding and they he is she she is also able to see the tuck what is felt so how to diagnose this is the diagnosis algorithm on clinical base so whenever there is brow out fracture with big defect may show may not show the, much of the motility disturbance but it may show enough thalamus and fgt usually can be negative fgt will be positive when there is brow out fracture with small defect with incarceration of muscle it will show restriction in both the fields but more in the opposite field of the action of muscle fgt will be positive fgt will also be positive whenever there is trap door fracture um usually happen in children may show marked motility disturbance in opposite direction and can be associated with bradycardia vomiting sink up and fgt will be strongly positive here fgt can be positive when there is flap tear of the muscle usually produces limitation of movement in the field of action fgt may be negative fgt will be positive when muscle is snapped or pulled into two show the limited action in the field of action but pull movement in the opposite direction fgt will be negative fgt will be positive contusion of muscle may show marked limitation in all the field just because of pain fgt fgt can be both can be positive partial laceration limited action in the field of action fgt may be negative fgt positive complete laceration definitely fgt negative fgt will be positive and uh, limited action in the field but good movement in the opposite direction complete disinsertion of muscle lost muscle same fgt will be strongly positive fgt may fgt may be negative and combination of anything can happen how to manage this whenever there is uh, certain red flag signs you have to operate within 24 hours or we as soon as possible whenever there is oculocardic reflex retrobulbar hemorrhage open globe injury csf leak or uh, muscle strangulation and you can wait till the edema subsides whenever you are till the time you wait we can prescribe simple prism if, if we are waiting for more time or simple and uh, medical management or occlusion just to avoid the uh, diplopia so when there is muscle contusion simple observation anti inflammatory and it results with the complete restoration of movement so simple sometime we may have to support with steroids as a medical management and be aware and tell the patient not to you know, not to do the nose blowing it can lead to emphysema even in this kind of patient whenever there is a trochlear injury and it is inflammation it can give you a uh, brown syndrome but whenever it seems simple contusion with medical management it can be treated partial laceration of muscle uh, usually you are able to see the muscle part so you are able to stitch it and it gives the good movement but sometime later on long standing cases contracture of the antagonist muscle also happen so this case requires sometime weakening of the antagonist muscle along with that complete laceration do not lose the patients just try to find out the muscle the muscle cannot go anywhere else other than its muscle sheet so try to find out the muscle sheet this is the thing you can do uh, if you are not able to find out uh, you have you can hook uh, sorry you can hook adjacent two muscles
you can hook adjacent two muscles and then try to find out the muscle. You are usually able to find out the muscle. You can stitch it well. And this is the post-operative movement you can regain. Sometimes muscle can be pulled, snapped into two. As I said, this muscle is already... This is very easy to find out because if you hook the adjacent two muscles and try to trace the intermuscular septum without pulling the globe, globe in the opposite direction, you'll be able to see the uh, muscle seat and muscle cannot go anywhere else other than its muscle seat. Here you can see complete muscle is found out. You can uh, suture it well and then you can gain the movements also. But whenever there is a lost muscle, though it is possible that uh, dynamic and MRI will definitely work to find out or sometimes we may have to take the support of EMG, it is possible that you are able to find out the muscle, you found out the muscle which is uh, incarcerated and strangulated but you may not get full movement so sometimes you may have to support it with the transposition of muscle which we will we'll talk in detail later on. So, um, uh, incarceration, incarceration of muscle whenever there is degree of anophthalmus more than two to three millimeters significant bone fracture and trapped muscle continued symptomatic diplopia beyond two weeks and FGT positive you need to operate and you need to release the muscle sometimes people wait for seven days that is always controversial but children way by you need to immediately act yeah. What is the aim of surgery? Permanently close the bony defect, free the entrapped muscle, cosmetically arrange a normal anatomy of the orbit and its con contents. So what are the routes available for orbitotromy? Transconjunctiva, transcutaneous and endonasal. Material available uh, are autologous bone, titanium mass, alloplastic material like PPE, mat pore, silicon sheet or combination of anything you can use nowadays absorbable material has come in the market which is too costly i don't have much of experience for that the materials are available pla pga pla uh, rapid soap or pga uh, osteomass is available but now a days people are doing patient specific implant with 3d printing that gives very good results so once you operate you need to see that it is uh, properly done and whatever implant you put, you need to attach it well. But uh, don't, uh, don't forget to do force duction test when you end the surgery. So this is post-operatively. Sometimes whenever there is white roof fracture, you need to op urgently operate the patient. MR entrapment also you, you need to release or LR entrapment also you need to release though it is common, but it can happen. Uh, Sometimes we may come, up, come across with uh, multiple fractures. So this patient, for this patient, actually I was called for you know, surgery at general uh, surgeon's place. So uh, we, we, I went there till he fixated all maxillary things and then we need to fixate the orbital part. So once the plating and everything floor is done, here we have put titanium uh, implant. But when you end the surgery, you, you need to sometimes fashion the titanium implant. But nowadays, as I said, 3D printing, uh, specific, patient specific implants are available, which is quite easy, but it is very costly. So don't forget to do the force duction test at the end. So sometimes it is possible that you feel that your, your surgery is over. This is a general surgeon's place, so you can see the thing, but it is uh, okay to do whenever you are giving some vision and some motility. So when here you can see post-duction test was about positive. You adjust implant and now it is negative. So that is the key. So this was the surgery. So later on, uh, patient can regain complete okay. good movement. Endonasal root also is possible. Complication of orbitotomy, as we all know, but it needs meticulous dissection, proper measurement of implant. And as I said, 3D printing helps very well. Infection can happen. Proper setup will not allow it to happen. With antibiotic, you can cure. Edema, just simple, can happen with the orbital compartment syndrome. Systemic steroid can help. Hemorrhage can cause pressure on optic nerve, reopen and ligate the vessel. Implant migration, reoperation, and reposition of the implant is necessary. Vision loss, mainly due to elevated pressure. So, compartmental syndrome, you need to open and release. 
herniation of tissue in antrum be, can happen just because of improper size of the implant. But whenever you are putting implant, see that the implant should not push too posteriorly, uh, so it will not damage the optic nerve. Some motility disorder may uh, stay after surgery due to just paresis uh, while, with, while initial surgery or usually or sometimes hydrogenic. In ophthalmos, as I said, but it can be taken care by patient-specific implant. Uh, pseudo also can happen with the atrophy and palpebral fissure abnormality can happen. So early surgical complication, as I said, orbital compartment syndrome and delayed surgical uh, certain, this is early and this is delayed surgical complication which we need to be taken care as i said about eight thing can happen to muscle is flap tear so uh, how the flap tear happens it just separates from the lamellar part this is there is a lamellar separation of the both the muscle and one part gets stuck into the uh, fracture so that will give limitation of action in both the areas this kind of flap tear can happen as a longitudinal flap tear. This is longitudinal flap tear, or it can be a longitudinal flap tear. It can be bewailed flap tear. So you need to examine how it is. Uh, again, this is a lamellar flap tear, or sometimes the flap uh, muscle is flap tear has happened and it is retracted back. At what place the avulsion of flap tear? Uh, flap from the insertion of MR. You can see evolution of the flap from the insertion. Here the evolution of the flap from mucocutaneous junction and here the evolution of lamellar, lamellar flap from very deep posterior level. So it can happen at any level. This patient presented to us with limitation of action and it was immediate uh, trauma. When we opened up the um, muscle and we could find out Videos is not playing. I'll just restart yeah, for a second. I'm so sorry. Okay. That's okay, ma'am. That's okay. Wait for you to log in back. Till then, we'll just uh, take one of the questions. If uh, Dr. Grover would like to answer it or Dr. Purin Zubasin or Dr. Mayur Vasa. Yeah. Uh, so there is one question and that is um, in orbital floor fractures, clinically, how do we assess whether anterior, mid or posterior orbit is involved? So what would be the different uh, Dr. Grover, suggestions? The kind of limitation of movement that you get may be different in, in the um, uh, different type of uh, fractures. Um, you may have a predominant uh, upward restriction or a predominant downward restriction uh, with the uh, fracture that is located in a different area. So those can be sometimes differentiating, although in clinical usage, you don't really benefit with that. You really depend on the um, to see the area of the fracture and differentiate. Right. So, and clinically, I don't think there is any significance as well because we're anyways focusing on least manipulation. Is that also right, sir? Yeah, that's right. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, can you able to see this slide? G, right now. Yeah, yeah. So this is the lamellar flap tear. You can see the half of the lamellar muscle has gone back. So it is very easy to find out, but it's very, very difficult to suture because when you are suturing, it may go further go back and tell your system not to pull the muscle when you are tying. So when you're tying the suture, your assistant actually has to push the globe in order to facilitate the closer. Otherwise, the muscle flap tear will happen more. So this is post-operatively after suturing. Um, this is another patient had a, a video sound. So this is another patient, you can say it is a uh, it is a bewailed flap tear. 
So you need to properly find out the muscle and suture it well. So this is post-operative picture of the same patient and post-operative picture. MR and uh, SR, as I said, you need to do. Uh, Sometimes it happens that you are taking the patient in with the history of trauma. So in this patient, you can see when, when we uh, did the muscle, you can just see the muscle is actually going into, into orbit. So when you are pushing, you can see it is going into orbit. It is not the, the muscle is not going along with the glow. So you need to have a uh, doubt that muscle is incarcerated if you have not done CT or MRI. Muscle sleep is very easy to treat because you have muscle sheet itself. Muscle is just slipped into its shape. So cut the sheet and just find out the muscle and reattach it back. It will be clear. Sometimes there can be a traumatic post sinus surgery. You can see the medial rectus and the inferior rectus is adhered with each other. This was an endoscopic guided post sinus surgery operated elsewhere. So you need to reopen. You need to operate the muscle and you can gain, gain the result after fixing up the lead deformity also. So sometime patient uh, muscle can be um, strabismus can be just because of bupivacaine. Scarring can happen after that bupivacaine, bupivacaine injection. And don't forget to treat the ptosis um, associated if it is associated. Vascular causes usually uh, keratico-cavernous fistula, history of trauma. And you can see even you can observe and you can see the dilated superior ophthalmic vein, which is the diagnosis. Sometime you can just look at and you can see the pulsation of the globe here. So a minute observation will able to tell you what is happening. After ligation of muscle, ligation of vessel, you may have to do surgery. Uh, surgery, can, uh, strabismus can happen just because of the paralysis. So uh, again, whenever you are treating, there can be non-surgical management with prism in glass, frenal prism, occlusion of one eye just to avoid the diplopia, segmental occlusion devices or uh, injection Botox. So this is a partial third nerve palsy and it is immediate. You can wait. Usually it uh, recovers back. This is, it is, though it is very rare, but traumatic IR palsy. So it is purely IR palsy. So usually isolated muscle palsy is very, very rare whenever it is supplied by third nerve, but it can happen with trauma. So, so when we look at the post-trauma horizontal paralytic strabismus usually happens with the sixth nerve palsy. The treatment available are recess reset. Recession can be adjustable. Marginal myotomy can be done and strengthening procedure Nowadays, all the strabismus surgeons are doing plication rather than res resection, but you can do resection. So this is the algorithm. Whenever there is a limited ocular uh, rotation, if duction is past midline, simple resection will work. But if duction is short of midline, do force generation test. If it is weak or no force generated, saccadic velo velocity analysis should be done. And if it is less than 100 degree per second, transposition of muscle should be done. But if it is moderate force generation, you can again do resection. If the saccadic velocity is more than 100 degrees, you can see again do resection of the muscle. So transposition post procedures available are Hamilton, Jensen procedure. In Hamilton procedure, we usually do lateral half of SR and LR attached to the LR. Um, SR and IR attached to the LR. In Jensen procedure, we Cut all the three muscles and attach with each other. Scott postures, augmentation, posterior augmentation sutures, we can just uh, augment whatever we have done this. Adjustable cross action VRT. This is a newer technique. This is split VRT. So when we attach the muscle, usually we just make a cross and then it gives the re adjustable. And now people, uh, we are doing usually modified Nishida's technique when there is no split, no disinsertion and uh, scleral fixation near lateral rectus is done. Post-trauma cyclovertical paralysis usually happens with fourth nerve palsy. We have pass three step test. We all, we all resident know same opposite, same. It, you can remember in this way. So it will give you a good clue. This is a uh, fourth nerve palsy. Uh, 
deviation can be cyclovertical. So whenever there is a superior oblique palsy, usually will be associated with I over X and V pattern. Usually this V pattern, the difference between up and down gaze will be more than 15 prism. So uh, can be in congenital infantile, but uh, whenever there is a trauma, it can happen when there is a uniocular trauma. These are the treatment available. When there is a moderate eye overaction, you can just resist 10 millimeter. If it's a severe eye overaction, you can resist 14 millimeter. Or sometimes you can do myectomy. It is really uh, people are not doing, we are not doing myectomy because recession is always a guided procedure. But whenever there is a very, very large B, and if you do myectomy in bilateral, sometimes you can just treat the more than 40 prism correction also. I, anteriorization, if spontaneous slow drift when occluded, inattentive upward, outward excyclotorsin you need to do IO anteriorization. And whenever there is bilateral uh, superior oblique palsy, the main difference from unilateral or bilateral is torsion. So usually that complaints tilting torsion, door frames. Uh, and usually mainly 10, prison, 10 uh, degree deviation on double Maddox road test. Uh, mainly chin down pressure, uh, position. Uh, rather than head tilt. It will not be head tilt because it is bilateral. So there will be chin down position, V isotropia. Primary position may show a very less deviation, but whenever you check, there will be alternating hypertropia. So LHT on right case and RHT on left case. So third nerve palsy, media, uh, we have treatment available our medial periosteal anchoring of the globe, periosteal anchoring of lateral rectus, with or without MR resection, plication, or Allen Scott's uh, um, suture, augmentation suture, or BPV injection. Split LR transposition to MR with or without cross section sutures, especially for the synergetic divergence and disinsert IR whenever there is a SID syndrome. And so you do disinsertion and then do supramaximal resection of uh, LR. So this is the um, third nerve palsy with aberrant regeneration. So we, as I said, there are other options available here. We have just done superior oblique muscle transposition to the medial rectus along with the medial rectus resection. So that can give you good result and good movements. So good movements, uh, though not in all gaze, but primary gaze is absolutely normal and later on operated for doses. Whenever there is third and sixth both, you need, don't have to do anything because usually patient keeps the eye in the primary gaze, but be aware of spread of committance. Then you have to treat as a fresh trabismus patient. Sometimes me other mechanical causes like seam black iron cause the strabismus. So in this girl had a deep chemical injury and the muscle was scared. So we have done AMG covering the muscle and once we did am amniotic membrane covering the muscle, she regained all the movements. Um, simple mechanical, just because of simblepharon, you need to treat. Very late presentation, I'll not go into detail of it because of simple corneal scar, you need to treat the amblyopia, do strabismus or operate the cataract first and then do strabismus surgery. So this is the strabismus correction after cataract surgery. Be aware of the pseudo strabismus. This is just lid defect. It is not the strabismus. This lead, this is just a process which gives you a feeling that it is a strabismus, but not pseudo strabismus. So monitor regularly. Surgery for large fracture, as I said, and trap muscle should be performed early. Extraocular muscle surgery is performed last, can be delayed sometime. Or sometimes maybe you may have to wait for 6 to 12 muscles. As I said, all options are available. So this was simple uh, orbital and muscle trauma. We'll just move to lead and uh, lacrimal injuries. Uh, you need to take uh, usually dynamic MRI and CT support whenever you are deciding for the treatment. Thank you. Should I move to other, another presentation? Uh, yes, ma'am. In the meanwhile, uh, maybe take a question, ma'am. Yes. Uh, may I request Dr. Dr. Grover sir or Purindra Bhasin sir while ma'am is uh, taking our next presentation. 
So the question is, what influences the type of implant material in an orbital fracture repair? The implant is decided on the basis of the kind of defect you have, the age group uh, that we are dealing with. Uh, there are the options really are um, either the uh, alloplastic implants or the autologous implants. And amongst the, the um, alloplastic implants, you have the permanent ones, you have the um, um, absorbable, resorbable ones. And amongst the um, uh, non-absorbable ones, again, there are all those materials which are bio-integrable. And then there are the other implants which are um, metallic like titanium, uh, which are non-reactive and uh, which only have some holes to allow the tissues to grow in. But they have a, either they can be shaped to a particular um, form which you desire or they come preformed in the shape to conform to the orbit. And then, of course, then there are those materials which are being used for patient-specific implants which have now become important. So you have this whole variety. You would use a, uh, an implant, a, a limited small fracture which can be easily covered by an implant. You would use a implant like metpore or you use uh, mm. um, any of the simpler materials which can just go across all the borders of the um, implant of the fracture and cover it well when you have removed all the incarceration and released all the contents. For a small fracture like a linear fracture like, like in a child which is due to elastic um, give of the bone and which has come back in position, you will just need a simple implant like a resorbable implant may be a good choice for this. But the better materials of resorbable implants are now being used for a lot more uh, other uses as well now, uh, increasingly being uh, favored by many users. Then, of course, if you have a fracture which involves a large area and you only have a posterior ledge left or you have a combined floor and medial wall fracture, then you would use a, an implant like a titanium implant, which has a medial wing as well as the floor. And you can uh, use the uh, posterior ledge to anchor that and use the um, medial part of the implant to cover the medial defect at the same time, giving it the correct shape conforming to the other side of the or other orbit and the patient specific implants for particularly tough cases huge losses or multiple fractures or total give of the floor or in patients who had multiple previous surgeries or old fractures where you can't really shape the orbit much by breaking it and bringing it together their patient specific implants would have a role so uh, there is a different role for a different type of implants it is important to use the right one for the right indication. Is there any role of navigation system and where should we suggest uh, such things? Navigation systems are particularly being used for those areas which are otherwise clinically difficult to visualize, like uh, those lesions which are close to the apex. For example, for fractures which are involving the optic canal, if you want to reach that area, and uh, you, you will not be able to see very much by the orbital approach. So there you may utilize navigation to be better oriented about the structure you're dealing with. But most other places you are able to visualize rather well through an orbital approach and there navigation does not have a role. Particularly if you use a, a magnifying loop and a headlight, you are able to see the medial wall very well, quite far, the floor quite well, at, at quite a distance, and in, in the orbit also for approaching the tumors, except for the lesions which are closer to the apex, your visualization is quite good, and navigation is not really necessary for that. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Roar, sir. Could you able to see my slides?
Not not yet. Not. Now, now to see your screen, ma'am, not the slides yet, ma'am. Can you see? Not yet, ma'am. Not the slides. Chair, could you open your PowerPoint presentation and minimize it and keep it on one side in a small uh, window and then restart with your screen share and click on PPT presentation? Yes, sir. <laughs> I'm already uh, done. Yes. Done, sir. <clears throat> Got it. Yes, sir. Yeah. Are you seen now? Yes, yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you, sir. So, uh, what Dr. Purendra sir is saying first uh, classification, we will we are just talking with this uh, orbital injury, lead injury. It comes in this classification. Uh, thorough examination and look for the intraocular injury first before starting to repair the lid tear. And what are the components for the examination? Foreign bodies, tissue loss, eyelash or eyebrow, lead margin, canalicular laceration, prolapse, fat, septal involvement, levator function, canthal tendon or anti uh, angle integrity and lag of thermos that you need to, in, under this heading, we need to examine the uh, lead tear and always look is properly inspection and radiological investigation when you are suspecting sometimes simple palpation if you uh, it may demonstrate the bony crepitus whenever there is a nasoethmoid injury so always look for that and then go ahead for the lead tear evaluation how will you evaluate the lead tear first you will ask for the time and nature of the injury is there any chemical or foreign bodies previous visual acuity lead function old photograph sometimes they may have they may carry driver's license that will guide you for the old photographs safety glasses or contact lenses worn or not and medical history including tetanus immunization look for the uh, lead trauma examination uh, sometime associated with the nerve uh, damage so you need to do in neurological investigation also evaluation also Sensory nerve function can be distorted by injury and tissue swelling. Just absolute numbness in the typical distribution of that periocular nerve like supraorbital, supratrochlear, infratrochlear, infraorbital, lacrimal and zygomatic facial should, be, should have a raised suspicion of nerve transaction. Injury to the motor nerves, especially the seventh cranial nerve must be evaluated because of condition of this nerve will affect the overall health of the eye, especially the cornea. So what are the management strategies? Save life, sorry, save life, save vision, save physiology, save anatomical structure. And then comes the cosmetic correction. So that should be first primary survey, resuscitation with ABC. Secondary survey and then comes the definitive treatment. Primary repair is always, always better than and it has got higher success rate whenever is it possible. Usually it should be done within 24 hours. So general condition consideration is 12 to 24 hours. First, you do debridement. Simple non-surgical, non-marginal laceration is there. Uh, deep lacerations and eyebrow laceration, lead margin laceration, canalicular laceration and cancel injuries need to be taken care, care. Whenever there is lead tear repair, you need to apply the quarter rule. So in choosing the surgical technique, like quarter rule says a lack of substance equal to or one quarter of the length of eyelid does not alter the static, dynamic, aesthetic of the eyelid. So you can just simply suture it without doing anything. So this is simple suture. 
you if defect is more than 25 to 35 and muscle uh, and the tissue loss is there in the accident you may have to support with semi um, tensile semicircular flap if you uh, defect is more than 35 percent then we have trans tarso marginal graft cutler bear technique mustard rotation flap and modified huggies technique so tarso marginal graft you can do sometime um, or, or uh, simple cutler beard procedure or modified or reverse huggies technique when the defect is more than 70 uh, degree or mustard rotation flap can be done but when there is a trauma when there is no lead you may have to completely generate uh, make the lead sometimes can take maternal skin graft donor scleral graft maternal oral mucosal graft will along with the amniotic membrane so you can just make one by one by one all four layers and you can um, de uh, make the lead sometimes patient with the uh, ptosis and how will you evaluate evaluate and manage the ptosis for that you need to know the cause of ptosis sometimes cause of ptosis can be before even primary reaper that is because of edema and ecchymosis direct injury to levator muscle or due to third nerve palsy second cause can be even after immediately after repair that again can be edema inappropriate opposition of levator muscle or due to third nerve palsy and there can be a late presentation of ptosis so if you look at the first cause you need to understand the lead anatomy so whenever there is a trauma if it is not touching the levator muscle it, though it may look ptosis but usually the ptosis will resolve by itself because the levator muscle is not injured it is just orbic uh, orbicularis is injured even you look uh, you feel that it is very deep cut but when the levator muscle is not approached usually patient you can see very good lps function here even this is deep cut and there is a fat prolapse, but the levator muscle is not uh, uh, injured. Patient regains the full movement and full correction. But whenever there is a levator injury, we will definitely have true ptosis or if when there is evolution or it can be from uh, up or down, it will be a true ptosis or with the fist or airbag can have true ptosis, which can be corrected very uh, if it is simple uh, lead laceration it can be corrected very well uh, the in first thing when there is edema medical management sometimes may have to give systemic steroid you can just wait and watch uh, just let the edema subside and then treat neurological again you can wait or you can give a steroid supplementation sometimes patient have a strabismus surgery and that is hydrogenic trauma to the lead which need to be taken care of. but when you look it is a late presentation of ptosis you need to evaluate uh, evaluate as we do in a prop primary evaluation with the destiny test like drooping of lead how to measure the drooping of lead if they saw in the picture excursion of lead usually it should be more than 15 to 18 millimeters so lps function you can just measure with this superior uh, rectus uh, evaluation tear strip function in order to decide the surgical method now, ellipse test when there is a muller's muscle is involved or ask the patient to look down and just evert the lead and see the how many seconds it goes back neurological test like bell's phenomena corneal sensation yawning to just to check the jaw winking traumatic jaw winking later on acquired is very very rare but you need to check skin crease just to uh, test uh, decide your surgeries margin reflex distance again mrd1 and mrd2 has to be measured but whenever there is a traumatic process usually will have aberrant lead movement so look for that aberrant lead movements pupillary changes fundus and some of the myasthenia signs associated signs as i said lead lag segmental ptosis but most whenever there is a traumatic ptosis you can see there is a high sulcus uh, sulcus is not seen so uh, usually it happens with the aponeurotic ptosis and aponeurotic dehiscence so you need to op operate uh, i'm sorry i could not put this uh, video here i had a very good video of aponeurotic dehiscence but i just forgot how will you decide for the surgery 
whenever there is a pair levator function, you can just approach the anterior approach to the levator advance advancement. And when it is not good, you can just check the frontal section. If it is good, you can just do bra suspension. And if it is not, you can just prescribe the crutch classes. We have three techniques available. Pacinellus servat, that is a conjunctivo molars resection. Um, and then levator resection. If it is more than 10, uh, usually you need to see the degree of ptosis. If it is less than 10, pacinellus servat. If it is more than 10, aponeurotic surgery. If it is less than 10 and more than 4 millimeter of ptosis, you can do levator resection. And if it is less, you can do bra suspension. But it, this uh, figures are always, always controversial and cutoff point can be any. Um, this is a bra suspension surgery. But in uh, our hospital, usually bra suspension, we do a tarsal plate suspension with the bra. And nowadays, uh, people are doing bra flap, bringing it to down and then suturing it to the tarsal plate that is also a newer technique which can be done along with that but always try to incorporate the suture uh, to create the lead crease uh, which should pass through the stump of or the uh, LPS, LPS muscle which are uh, just going to the lead area. So this was dog bite and it was just done um, bra suspension materials available lot many materials are available facial data, silicon proline supramid and you need to see what is effective easily available economical easily placed and removed and involve few complications skin uh, lps can be done through skin approach conjunctival approach adv advancement can be done nowadays we are doing lps plication also that also gives very good result but for that you need to the, do proper blunt dissection and here is the clue whenever you will cut the orbital septum there will be fat prolapse so that there you can see that you have already approached the lp aponeurosis and then you can operate it well you can reset you can just uh, advance or you can plicate it but sometimes patient has a multiple type of injury this patient had a vertical injury horizontal injury and canalicular injury so after doing bicanalicular intubation we did the vertical uh, this and this should be equal when you are taking bite and then we did horizontal repair lead repair layer by layer from conjunctiva to conjunctiva and uh, muscle to muscle so you have to be meticulous enough to operate and give a good result post-operatively with good movements also later on sometime you may have to support it with skin muscle resection so this patient came after six months back and it was there was little tosis so we just supported with skin muscle resection and it went well whenever there is aversion of lead always look for the uh, and along with medial canthal tendal injury you you can fix it with double arm 40 silk suture uh, you just uh, place through the lateral wound edge with a substantial bite should be there in order not to cut through so and whenever there is neurological third nerve palsy i've already discussed everything whenever there is third nerve palsy but tosis can be, will be there with third nerve palsy which need to be taken care associated strabismus also can be taken care but look for simple broad osis here there is no lead tosis but this is traumatic broad osis so you can just operate it well after a repair simple mechanical tosis tosis just because of the scarring of wound repair that was post trauma uh, mechanical tosis and it was we just managed it with skin grafting uh, sometimes patient can come with uh, immediate when there is a skin burn by chemical so you need to treat it properly before operating there is a thermal burn also can be associated when there is acute stage in the chemical burn there will be a lead edema so after burning of lead you need to take care of the edema in our area they are doing lot of superstition and they put vegetative material on the skin so that is also kind of trauma we see in our area and sometimes there is burn we can just put the collagen uh, mesh also dosis is there can be just simple because of simpleferon which uh, 
once you remove mucous membrane graft, it can work very well. Uh, you need to treat it with later on. But whenever there is a reparative stage of the trauma, specifically chemical for lead may have entropion. So uh, usually this entropion will be a shortening of the posterior lamella, which lead needs to be taken care. Sometimes associated entry lamellar surgery, you need to do. Trichiasis also can come with it. Uh, we do uh, ciliary bear transfer. Sometimes whenever there is a trichiasis, it is not available when, until and unless you find one single draw of that uh, lead lashes. But if you find a single draw, double draw of lead lashes and if it is available you can just do the ciliary bed transfer which is very good technique and it treats very well so so this is the patient uh, treated with the ciliary bed transfer uh, trichiasis with simblepharon and keratinization of lead happens you may have to take the support of mucous membrane graft so once the mucous membrane is graft is placed you can take care of the vision and the cosmetic correction also for the lead. Trichiasis of upper eyelid, entropion and sulcus deformity sometimes just happen and lengthen the posterior lamella with canthotomy. And trichiasis with of upper lid entropion, sometimes with sulcus deformity, volume augment, augmentation can work. There can be sometimes enchyloblepheron. Enchyloblepheron just release the band and you'll be able to treat. Ectropion cicatricial can happen. So whenever there is ectropion, you need to release all the scarred tropin uh, uh, tissue. Cicatrix, you need to remove completely and then may have to support with the skin grafting. Traumatic leg of thermos can be very severe or can be simple, a small leg of thermos, which could be treated with simple tarsorapy. But if it is large leg of thermos, if it is big leg of thermos, you can just you may have to support with skin grafting. This is also a and in order when patient reaches to you in early stage, you can just do the limbal cell transplant also from the other eye. But certain patient needs very, very meticulous. Uh, treatment whenever there is electric burn or firecracker or thermal burns or electric plus thermal burns we may not be able to save the lead but we can do something cosmetic correction as i said mechanical cicatrix you need to take care properly medial canthal tendal injury also as i said previously you need to do because there will be associated with the lacrimal things also uh, this patient had a traumatic neuropathy of uh, optic neuropathy of good eye. So this eye is not actually, uh, there is no vision in this eye. That was only this eye with leg of thalamus. So we just did the segmental bra suspension. We just lifted only medial canthus. He's a uh, uh, medial canthus and he's able to maintain, he is able to see through that uh, mechanical uh, process can happen just because of keloid remove keloid and reoperate again can be foreign body granuloma or suture granuloma need to take care simple don't forget small foreign body which can create granuloma or foreign body can be too large uh, can come through the orbit including 10 each foreign body also so you need to take care of that pseudotosis as i already said can happen with the bra with the uh, uh, orbital injury so you need to take care of pseudotosis with thysis bulbi also you feel that that is a pseudotosis so uh, and you need to treat the orbital whenever there is orbi uh, orbital trauma there can be fornix deformity and socket deformity can have shallow fornix can have shared fornix can have obliterated fornix wet contracted uh, de socket deformities or dry contracted socket deformities everywhere you can just treat the surface and volume augmentation treating of surface can be done with amg mmg and volume augmentation replace the implant dermis pad graft or subperiosteal graft can help help so fornix uh, deepening with amniotic membrane can be done mucous membrane graft also can be done i will not show all the surgeries here the mucous membrane is done this is post-operatively, that is a fornix formation and don't forget to put the fornix, for, fornix forming suture, but sometimes you may have to do lead uh, grafting along with the fornix formation and then fit with the prosthesis. 
um, fornix forming suture is must when you are doing when you are dealing with the fornix forming uh, treat, treatment on simulacron ring also in earlier phase is necessary sometimes it happens uh, it can be treated with the uh, confirmer but in this baby if you see there is a uh, in this patient we did lateral canthotomy with volume augmentation and fornix formation by amniotic membrane graft so that was the hermesphere graft was placed in it and then you fit the prosthesis so you can give at least some cosmetic correction but this kind of patient needs extensive treatment that was acid burn and um, alkali burn and then uh, we could not save the eye, but we could do something. Uh, whenever there is inappropriate processes, just treat and treat the pseudotosis. So um, pseudotosis again can be because of high traumatic hypotropia. Uh, what are the complications? When you are not treating process, there will be a complication of exposure keratitis. When you operate, can be an infection, scarring, or just undercorrection, overcorrection. Uh, asymmetry of lead crease can be lead curvature difference the lead is uh, properly uh, lifted up but the curvature is not proper flat curvature can be there notching can be there or later on segmental doses also can be there what is an ideal situation in ideal situation patient should be able to close the lead patient's cosmetic correction functional correction everything could be done properly but in this case first we need to think about saving life then comes save the vision. Then comes the then comes save physiology. We should be have good movement post operatively. Save anatomical structure, and then comes the cosmetic correction. Thank you so and much, ma'am, for that. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much, ma'am. Do uh, I have ten? Five minutes because it's only one lacrimal presentation is left. If uh, if needed, I'll definitely speak. Whatever you say, uh, ma'am. Uh, one presentation, uh, ma'am. You can share lacrimal injury. Yeah, ma'am. If you want yeah, to, continue. Share. yeah. Share. I think you can continue, ma'am. Yes, sir. I'll I'll just share the lacrimal. In the meanwhile, <clears throat> can we uh, take a question, ma'am? Yes. Uh, are you able to see my slides? Ma'am, no, no. the uh, older one, ma'am. <laughs> now? Mm, no, okay, I'll I, I do. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Now? Yeah, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. You're able to? Yeah. Now you are able to see? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. It's not moving. Ma'am, just click on the screen once. Yeah. Then you can move forward. Yeah. yeah. So uh, we'll just move into lacrimal uh, injuries. So lacrimal injury can happen with direct laceration, stab wound, dog bite, or traction. Or sometime in our area, most of the patient uh, during cattle care, they will have an injury of lacrimal canaliculus injury. It can be indirect injury, blunt trauma, fist or airbag. But if you look at the consequences, 10% suffer from constant or nearly constant epiphora. 40% have symptomatic epiphora with ocular irritation. 50% fairly asymptomatic in case of one functioning canaliculus, which is not injured. So, um, primary repair, as I said, it's always better than the secondary repair and primary repair has to be done within 24 or 48 hours. To find out the, can to do the canalicular repair, you have to have controlled condition in operation room, proper anesthesia, magnification, optimal illumination and uh, endoscope will definitely help. What are the steps to do canalicular uh, repair? Step one is location of severe uh, medial cut and step, uh, and that is that requires understanding of medial canthal anatomy for exploration of medial end. So the first thing what we do is simple inspection. If you are able to see the pharyngeus ring reflex and you are able to find out 
it's much much better but it's very difficult uh, sometime if you are not able to find out you may have to take support of irrigating cannula fluorescein bss yellow viscoelastic or methylene blue but it's very very difficult once you are finding out the severe medial cut and then comes the anastomosis but then you need to confirm with the railroad technique once you confirm then only you can do anastomosis with stand just to prevent the strictures again it could be bicanalicular or monocanalicular silicon tube plane or propart intubation tube or monocanalicular mini monoca or simple teflon sleeve you can use step four will be pericanalicular suturing um, even if you are not uh, doing that pericanalicular suturing and if you are putting stent usually it uh, repair uh, it regenerates and repairs epithelization happens by itself but if it's, it's better if you do with that along with the reconstruction of medial canthal tendon injury this is a mini monoca you just have to uh, slide once you see the pharyngas ring reflex it starts from the distal and then you can enter into the medial part and it goes this is the pharyngas ring reflex where you are able to see properly it has got its own advantage uh, and disadvantage advantage is it reduces the punctal injury risk of punctal injury or cheese wiring and very easy uh, retrieval is possible um, it is really really costly uh, teflon sleeve of uh, any of the intracat we can use but it is a uh, not a inert material so we can just use for temporary so for seven days it's okay but it is not inert material this can be used in upper lid also but you need to fixate the suture this is upper lid surgery and teflon sleeve can be used even in a whenever there is a stricture so the teflon itself will create the passage and then you leave the teflon sleeve and then just pull the piston and fixate it it is a very cheap and easily available in all operation room, but uh, local inflammation can be much more with that and extrusion will be uh, there because it is not an inert material. So that comes the pigtail probe technique. Uh, pigtail probe, you can just find out the medial cut uh, at end and you can just pass the suture or any silicon tube uh, and then just tie it. Disadvantage of pigtail probe is it is very, very thick and sometimes it damages the canaliculus. The most important part and difficult most part is finding out the medial cut end of the canaliculus from this mass. It is really difficult. So uh, we have uh, designed some of the uh, devices where you are, if you are not able to, if on inspection, if you are not able to see the medial cut end, we have just uh, done the probing of upper canaliculus and then 4O proline suture we have just made blunt on table and then we have we have just blunt made blunt by MD and then you can see the tape is blunt. Yes. I'm sorry, Hello. why is it not getting close? So you are passing, you are again dilating the punctum and this is blunt tip 4 oproline. Uh, we are passing through uninjured uh, canaliculus and, and you can see from where it has come out. It, it will not go anywhere other than the cut end of the canaliculus. So once it is coming out, this the technique is you just don't push. You can see it has come out. And now you'll be able to see the flaring gas ring reflex. So that same thing, we can just pass through the railroad technique through the other end and see proline suture act as a stent material. We tied it with each other and then we did the cautery. But it is a it is definitely a cost effective, easy available technique, easy technique. Learning curve is also less, but it has got 
its own disadvantage as proline is very strong material and it can cause the corneal irritation or it can just cause the shaving of the shaving off of the um, canaliculus roof uh, and it is not properly effective in post traumatic strictures so we came up came uh, again with the silicon tube with the same needle and now we have that inert material available with the same technique we are just passing through the silicon tube which is easily available this is blunt tip cannula same cannula and the silicon tube is available which you can tie with each other and only one tube can be used in 10 patients you just slide the knots in the canaliculus it has got advantage of all the technique and cost effective and easy to use it can could be used in children also you have to give systemic antibiotics steroids um, antibiotic eye drops four times a day and syringing could be done can be done very easily along with the tube so you can just confirm also post operatively disadvantage if not used skillfully can create the false passage false anastomosis cannot give confirmation of safety surety of the right passage when both the canaliculi are injured of course, it can be used secondarily to create new passage when there is a stricture. And um, as I said, the complication again can be false anastomosis, cheese wiring when there is too tight tube, ocular irritation, infection, local inflammation, granuloma formation and extrusion or prolapse of the tube can happen. So uh, to avoid this in a, uh, false anastomosis, we are coming up with the same cannula with olive teeth. So it will not pass through the, uh, it will not make the wrong passage. So as I said, I'll just conclude with primary steps. When there is polytrauma, you need to give life support care first or includes nasoethmoid complex, then side support care, then functional care, and then cosmetic care with the team approach. So uh, again, uh, first step, as I said, location of end, second is anastomosis of canaliculus, middle canthal tendon disruption and avulsion management, soft tissue management with lacrimal drainage system, and then comes the uh, NLD involvement uh, treatment if uh, there is an NLD uh, trauma associated with the canalicular trauma. So after lead tear, tear and other repair, you, you can do a post-traumatic DCR with the skin incision or any of the incision you can uh, choose. But we have seen lot many cases with the chemical injury and doing the lacrimal sac injury uh, with lacrimal sac injury. So what are the management options? Canalicular system with the chemical burns, thorough wash and no syringing because you're pushing more chemical into the sac. So no syringing should be done. Conjunctive ODCR is the best choice of treatment. Probing with bicanalicular intubation definitely can done. Probing with modified pigtail technique, as I showed the technique, drusty canaliculus tommy silicon can be used. When there is lacrimal sac and NLD is injured, probing with bicanalicular intubation if puncti are normal. Mm -hmm. NLD block with loss of uh, punctai and severe canalicular stricture, intracat DCR can be done with skin root or conjunctival root. So, and you can put the implant with the endoscopic guided treatment. So, you need to treat and you may have to take support of CTDCG, which will give you all the clues. We have done intra, uh, we have used the in Teflon sleeve to treat the um, canaliculus as well as we have created same passage moving it to 45 degree and open into the uh, sac so that is intra cat DCR. that is a temporary measure uh, and again as i said teflon sleeve is not inert material you, you, you need to put the silicon material along with that so and sometimes simple tosis as i said just because of fat atrophy so you may have to you may have to inject the fat thank you everyone for patient listening thanks a lot Thank you so much, ma'am, for a detailed presentation. It was really comprehensive. And we had one question from canalicular lacerations, which was just covered by you. Uh, may I now request Dr. Grover, sir, and Purindra Bhasin, sir, for their expert comments? I think, uh... I think this was an exhaustive uh, presentation of uh, 
orbital and uh, orbit and um, lacrimal um, trauma and uh, Uh, this was really a fantastic presentation i really appreciate and thank uh, dr shreya for highlighting everything and including everything into it uh, dr robert sir please shreya's presentation was marvelous for the amount of work that we have done there is some distortion in the voice yes yeah, this is echo Yeah. maybe if there are two devices on somewhere they can be one of them can be ji ji please mute please. others i think uh one second mehul sir could you please help with that yeah yeah please ji ji so i think mute uh, can the amount of uh, work that she has done in all these areas including the um ocular motility disturbances with trauma or the eyelid canalicular and orbital repair work which they have done is is marvelous and that is what contributed to a very comprehensive presentation which dealt with all the aspects of uh, eyelid trauma orbital trauma and lacrimal trauma as well as trauma to the uh, extraocular muscles and other causes of ocular motility disturbance um it will be nice to take up any of the questions that the audience may have um she has organized it very well she has covered the aspect of injuries to eyelids loss of tissue canalicular injuries the canthal injuries the ptosis caused the lid defects caused and um, i think the aspect of deformities many of them involving the eyebrow and so on and so forth have all been well covered so we right. the best to take up any yes. questions yes. on there is there is one question ma'am that uh, you mentioned about uh, bicanalicular stenting in most of the cases uh, what is your experience with mini monocular stenting like the unicanalicular stents yeah mini monocular stent uh, yeah definitely we can use many mini monocast stent only the difference is uh, one is cost second is whenever you are using bicanalicular stenting the cosmetic thing comes because it is not seen here and you can retain it for even 2 to 3 months so mini monoca you have to take out uh, later on uh, after 6 weeks but even this bicanalicular stent uh usually takes care of both the canaliculus even if it is not injured and patient especially children i am dealing with most of the children so they not rub the eye mini monoca is simple rubbing of the eye and it will just extrude so that can cause the corneal irritation but by canalicular we have not seen anything except cheese wiring effect when we are putting you know, very tight or sometimes shaving off of the roof of canaliculus If by mistake or by mischief, if child pulls the part from the nose, that can happen. Right, Mehul, so we actually want to hear your inputs to like, is there any way to join uh, to avoid that echo? That would be great. Uh, for this, sir, what is your? Uh, stop command? my my. Uh, I'll I'll stop my audio. Right, so that we can hear sir's inputs too. But in this sir, till then, could you please tell your uh, uh, like statements about mini monocular stenting or unique canalicular stent of any type? I think uh, Dr. Grover uh, can tell better because, uh, uh, but here we are uh, doing mini monocular stents uh, at our center, but sparingly because of the cost involved into it. but results are good and it is easily it can be done easily that's what uh, i can say and uh, dr bhushaya and dr grover are in, are the better judges to be to give their expert comments i think the monocanalicular stenting has uh, become more popular than bicanalicular of late because of the fact that you're not touching a um, uninvolved or uninjured canaliculus and the risk of causing any hydrogenic problem to that is reduced again the availability of the indigenous uh, uh, name that you have cut down on the cost significantly so that cost is no longer a major factor 
but really the technical difficulty um, of putting a, a stent which is to be uh, retrieved from the nose and the manipulation involved can sometimes be a little tougher. So um, uh, many people would prefer um, um, monocanalicular stenting. And in case a uh, uh, stent is not handy, you don't have a mini monoka available, there is the option of using the um, Teflon tubing of the intracat, which is always available in the OTs as a, and as a standby, I mean, as for the other purposes. And uh, since we now increasingly realize that uh, keeping a tube for more than six weeks is probably counterproductive, we um, have increasingly shifted to monocanalicular stenting. Right, so Mehul, sir, would you like to say something? Uh, I don't think I can comment after all these expert people. This is not my subject, so I cannot <laughs> comment on this. Dr. Grover is the final word, and I don't think anybody can comment after this. <laughs> right, so, and like, if I, Dr. Actually, Santosh like is there, he can give us uh, his expert opinion also. Dr. Honavar, please. Right, so uh, I'm sure that he will be able to highlight uh, the same too. Yeah. I think his uh, connectivity because... is... Just give me one second. So, Bob, could you take the next question, sir? Uh, <clears throat> there is one question. In a penetrating trauma causing lint laceration, what are the markers of LPS involvement? So if you have a fat prolapse occurring, I mean, if you can see the um, presentation of the uh, pre-aponeurotic pad of fat, that is the best indication that levator may be injured. At times, the um, and the presence of spring will not allow you to judge the extent of ptosis that has occurred, but uh, the presence of fat should always be In case uh, that is present, um, then you should explore the elevator and look for its dehiscence or disinsertion from the tarsus or look for tears in it and try and put it together with 5060 Y. You should not uh, try and uh, suture back any orbital septum or replace any fat, but putting together the fibers of elevator to the best of your ability would certainly help. Right, so, Prince, sir, I think uh, sir had a meeting which had to start at 9.15, so he had already logged in, so he couldn't okay. come online. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> right, sir. Uh, so, thanks a lot, Shreya ma'am. That was a very comprehensive and I'm sure very difficult lecture to put together because it had very important and multiple components. And uh, I'm sure that that deserved two classes separately and you have beautifully put it together in one. Thanks a lot for that. And thank you, panelists, for uh, uh, you know making this a very good discussion as well. And the next session we will have on November 25th, and that will be by Dr. Mehul Shah, sir. And uh, it will be corneoscleral trauma and traumatic cataract. So uh, we will all see you there. Uh, would you like to say anything for the concluding note, ma'am? Thank you. Thank you. I'm, I'm really grateful to Dr. Honavar sir and especially to Dr. Grower sir for helping me in all this presentation. I'm really grateful to uh, Rolika and Shefali. Uh, You're doing wonderful, wonderful work and Shubha also for helping us. Um, we'll just uh, waiting for our next presentation. We'll be there. Thank you all. Thank you, Purendra sir, for just uh, staying with us and commenting for the presentation. Thanks a lot Thank to everyone. Thanks Thank a lot. you so much, everyone. Thank you. And Thank gentle you, reminder to the audience. Yes, sir. So please go ahead. Oh, no, uh, it is just thanks to you all and Dr. Hunavar, Dr. Santosh Hunavar, please. Really, it is uh, very, very good that you have taken um, the trauma into the mainstream.
thank you thank you so much i think it should be we should be thankful to all of you for taking trauma to the mainstream <laughs> this is just a four session but you all have created like a, like a whole landscape out there so thanks to all of you thank you sir thank, thank you very you. much from the otsi for yes. taking up this subject and uh, putting it is uh, us into the mainstream so <laughs> people will have more uh, sensitization regarding ocular, ocular trauma uh, rather ophthalmic trauma that is true sir thank you. thank you thank you so much everyone and just a gentle reminder to the audience please uh, log in and uh, you know uh, register yourself for i focus offline which is happening in north thank you everyone have a good night bye thank you